Please join me in welcoming to Distinctive Voices at the Beckman Center, Dr. Bonnie Bassler. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It's a big honor to get to give one of these talks, and I'm really grateful to Susan and her team for inviting me, and I also know your teacher. So I've known him for, so, yeah, so, and I know, I'm really touched that you guys came. I know that's a big deal to come out in an evening. There's other things to do. So anyway, thanks to everybody. It's a big deal to come out, to come listen to this talk. So I only have one goal for this lecture, and that's to try to convince you that bacteria can talk to each other. And if I manage to do that, I sort of have a secondary goal, which is to try to make you believe that they're multilingual. And so before I get to that, what I want to do is to make sure that we all know what bacteria are so that I can get into the nitty-gritty of how they communicate. So this first slide shows a sort of generic picture of a bacterium, a cartoon of an E. coli, for example, that would live in your gut. And all bacteria look pretty much like this one. They're single-celled organisms, and they're covered in a membrane, which is like their skin. So that keeps the outside out and the inside in. And then inside of them, they have a cytoplasm, which is kind of a goop that has all of the biomolecules that make them alive, just like you and I have inside of our cells. And then what's special about bacteria is that they only have one piece of DNA. So they just have one chromosome that encodes all of the genes that gives them all the traits that they have. And so they're very simple. They only have a few thousand genes. And so what bacteria do for a living is kind of mundane. They consume nutrients from the environment, they grow to twice their size, they cut themselves down the middle, and one cell becomes two, and so on and so on. So they eat, they grow, and they divide. And so we've known about bacteria for 400 years, and because they live this seemingly simple life of just growing and dividing and growing and dividing, they've always been considered to be these incredibly asocial, reclusive organisms. Once they divide in half, each sister cell goes its own way, with no knowledge, if you will, of the other cell. And so, um, so they've always been considered to just be these itty-bitty, you know, invisible things that each do their own thing. But what I would like to argue to you is that you have an intimate relationship with bacteria um, that you might not know about. So they get a lot of press when they do bad things, but they don't get very much press when they do good things. So first I wanted to tell you about some of the good things that bacteria do before we get into the bad things that you've undoubtedly heard of. So what I did on this slide, this is supposed to be you, this man, this is human, and what I've done is to make all of these circles represent the cells of your body. So these cells would be all the cells that make up the human body. It takes about a trillion cells to make each one of us. So there's a trillion human cells in you that make you alive. Well, it turns out at any moment in your, your life, you have 10 trillion bacterial cells in you or on you. So there's 10 times more bacterial cells in and on you than there are human cells. And of course, you guys like science. That's why you're here tonight. So you know it's not really your cells. It's your DNA that makes you who you are. You know, it's your genetic information. So I've also done that calculation. So this is my human being made up of A's, G's, T's, and C's, which are the, the genetic code. So we know how many genes there are for people because we have the human genome. We have about 30,000 genes. Well, it turns out you have 100 times more bacterial genes than human genes working in you or on you all of your life. So no matter which of these metrics you like, you're either 10% human or more likely you're only 1% human. The other 99% is bacterial. And so what I want to, to tell you is that these bacteria are incredibly useful to us. They keep us alive. They coat us in an invisible body armor that keeps environmental insults from hurting us. They help you digest your food. They make your vitamins. They educate your immune system, and they keep bad bacteria out. They do all kinds of things for us that you can't live without. So they are not passive riders. They're playing an incredibly important role in maintaining our health. And you never, almost never hear about that. What you do hear about is when they do nasty things. And so I don't want to pretend like they're all goody two-shoes. There are all kinds of bacteria out there. I put a few of them on this slide that have no business being in you or on you ever. And if they are, they make you incredibly sick. And so these are some of the characters that you've seen in the newspaper because when these bacteria get in or on you, you get ill, unlike the commensal or mutualist bacteria that are supposed to be living in or on you.
So bacteria have these two sort of lives. There's all these bacteria out there that do good things. There are all these bacteria out there that that are disease causing. And the question that my group had was how can bacteria do anything at all? Whether you're thinking about them being good or thinking about them being bad, as we've already talked about, they're incredibly tiny. And if it's really true that they just divide in half and each one does its own thing, how can they make us healthy or make us sick? And so we wondered how bacteria could do all of the things that they do on this earth. And what I'm going to try to tell you tonight is the way that they do anything is by talking to one another with a chemical language, by counting one another and by acting in synchrony in large groups and carrying out tasks in groups that they could never accomplish if they simply acted alone. And so that's what I'm going to tell you about um, that we've learned in the last decade. And what I thought I would do, since this is like this a special night, is to give you sort of a, a historical view of how we got to this place of thinking about bacteria as acting as these enormous multicellular organisms. So I'm just going to take you through the path that led to this idea. And it actually all started with a very crazy observation that involved this squid. So what you're looking at is the Hawaiian bobtail squid that's been turned on its back. And I hope what you can see is right here are two glowing lobes. And what these lobes are are a specialized light organ that's under the mantle or the, or the body of the squid. And living in that light organ is a marine bacterium named Vibrio fisheri. So this is a harmless marine bacterium that has the special property that it makes bio luminescence. So this glowing that you're seeing from this picture is actually light that's produced by the bacteria. So the bacteria live inside this squid in this little light organ at something like 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th cells per mil. We have no idea how the squid grows the bacteria to this high number. But the bacteria are in there and what they do is that they make and release a small molecule that you can think of like a hormone. And so what happens is when the bacteria are in this light organ, since they're trapped in there, since they're making and releasing this molecule, that molecule is trapped inside the light organ with the bacteria. And it tells the bacteria you're inside, not outside, where this molecule would float away. And so the bacteria recognize that the molecule is round, that means they have neighbors around, and they turn on light. So they detect that that molecule is there, it tells them there's a lot of cells around because everybody's participating in making it and the bacteria produce bioluminescence. And so the reason the bacteria are willing to do that is because this squid organ is loaded with amino acids and sugars and all kinds of goodies. It's a much richer, happy, happy fatter life to live inside of this squid than to have to fend for yourself free living in the ocean. So the selection from the bacterium's point of view is that the squid feeds it. Now, the reason the squid is willing to do that is because it wants that light. And so the way that this symbiosis works is this squid, it's a very dramatic picture. The squid's only about this big, full grown. It's an after dinner talk. I have to keep you people entertained. So this little squid is called the Hawaiian bobtail squid because it lives just off the coast of Hawaii. So it lives just in shallow, knee deep water. And it's nocturnal. So during the day, the squid buries itself in the sand and sleeps. But then at night, it has to come out to hunt. And so on bright nights, when there's lots of starlight or moonlight, that that light can penetrate the depth of the water the squid lives in. So what the squid has done is developed a shutter. It's just the squid's ink sac that it can open and close over this light organ. And then the squid has detectors on its back so it can sense how much starlight or moonlight is hitting its back. And then it opens and closes this shutter so the amount of light coming out of the bottom, which is made by the bacteria, exactly matches how much light hits the squid's back so the squid doesn't make a shadow. So it actually uses the light from the bacteria to counter illuminate itself in this anti-predation device. So it's sort of like the stealth bomber of the ocean. It makes itself invisible to predators that would see its shadow, calculate its trajectory, and eat it. So the advantage, the evolutionary advantage from the, for the squid is that it gets protection. But then if you think about it, the squid has this terrible problem because it's got this dying 10 to the 12th cells per mil culture of this bacterium, and it can't maintain that. And so what happens is every morning when the sun comes up, the squid buries itself in the sand to sleep, and then it has a pump that's attached to its circadian rhythm. So when the sun comes up, the squid pumps out like 95% of the bacteria. So now the bacteria are dilute, and that little hormone is gone, so the bacteria don't make light. But then as the day goes by, the bacteria grow and divide and grow and divide, they all release the molecule, the molecule builds up, and at night the light comes on exactly when the squid needs it. And so the reason to tell you that ridiculous story, besides the obvious cheap theatrics involved, is because <laughs> this is, this is, no, there's actually a science point. This is where we, the first system where we 
figured out that these bacteria could talk with these chemicals. And so this, so I'll just re reiterate what I've just said. So this bacterium is Vibrio fischeri. And so what we figured out is that when the bacteria is alone, so this will be my cartoon of a bacterial cell. When it's at low cell density, the bacteria make and release this molecule, right? So I have this depicted as these red triangles. So if the bacteria are alone, the molecule drifts away. And so they don't make light. But then as they grow and divide, since everybody's making that molecule, the local amount of that molecule increases exactly proportionately to cell number. And when the molecule hits a certain amount, it tells the bacteria you have this many neighbors, and then all of them change their gene expression, which is behavior, in unison, and they turn on light. And so that's the phenomenon. And then, of course, we brought the tools of molecular biology to this to try to figure out how does this work. And so what we figured out was that this, this again is supposed to be the Vibrio Fischeri cell, is that the bacteria have a protein, an enzyme, whose job it is is to make that little hormone molecule. And then that hormone just flows out of the bacteria, so it just flows across the bacterial membrane, and the more cells there are, the more of that molecule there is. When the molecule hits a certain amount, it gets recognized, it gets found, and it gets bound by a receptor that's on the cell surface. And these are just like the hormone receptors that are on your cell surfaces. So the molecule slots in there like a lock and key, and it sends information into the cell to tell the bacteria to turn on light. Right? Oh, you guys can ask me questions in the middle, too. I, I was supposed to say that ahead. So everybody gets that, right? The bacteria make the molecule. The more cells there are, the more of it, it is. It fits into this receptor, and information comes in, and the bacteria turn on the genes that make light in unison. Okay? So um, that's how it works, and why this is interesting and why I'm here tonight is because <laughs> even though we found this in this ridiculous bacteria, then we started to look at this to see is this just some anomaly of some crazy bacterium that lives in the ocean, and the answer is no. In the last decade, we have found hundreds and hundreds of species of bacteria that all have an enzyme that makes a signal molecule, a hormone. They all have a partner protein that binds the hormone, and when the cells get to a certain number, they turn on all kinds of genes and behaviors that they want to express when they're in a community, but not when they're alone. And so now we have a fancy name for this. We call it quorum sensing. The bacteria vote with these chemical votes. The vote gets counted, and then everybody responds to the vote. So that's the molecular biology underneath this. We've also now started to ask, what are these hormones? What are these molecules? And so the first one that we figured out, so right, these are these red triangles on my last slide, is this one. This is the molecule. These are just carbons that Vibrio Fischeri uses to talk with, right? So that, those things that I'm using as cartoons, the red triangles, those are 3D molecules. And so this is Vibrio Fischeri's word. And then we started to look in all these other bacteria that we knew had quorum sensing, and then what I've done here is to just put a smattering of the different molecules that we've purified from different species of bacteria. So each one of these has a word that it talks with. And what you're supposed to get from this slide is that all of these molecules are related. So if you look at the left-hand part of these molecules, they're identical. But if you look at these right-hand parts, these are carbons, every single bacterium has a little bit different molecule than everybody else. And so what that does is to confer exquisite species specificities to these languages. So these really do fit like locks and keys into these partner receptors. And so what I mean by that is if I take the Vibrio Fischeri molecule and I put it on serratia, nothing happens. And likewise, the serratia molecule does nothing to Vibrio Fischeri. These molecules allow intraspecies communication. This is how I count my siblings. These are private conversations the bacteria have with their brothers and sisters so that they can count how many of them are around and when they ought to turn on and off genes as a community. So that's how, we, how it works. We've also now gone on to ask, well, what are all these other bacteria doing with quorum sensing? And so I explained to you how it makes sense for bioluminescence, right? It doesn't help that squid if a couple of bacteria make some photons of light. They all have to do it together to get light to protect the squid. And so we've gone on to look at these other bacteria, and I just put a couple of them up here because these are bacteria that I, you'll either have heard of or have encountered. So this one, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, is an opportunistic human pathogen. This is just a bacterium that lives in the soil. You and I encounter it every day of our lives. It's completely harmless to us unless you have cystic fibrosis. So you probably know that people who have CF, this disease CF, they have a genetic mutation in their lungs, so they can't clear their lungs. You and I breathe in all kinds of gobs of stuff, and we have mechanisms in our lungs to keep them sterile. 
People who have CF can't do that. And so they're all, their lungs are always colonized with a mixed bacterial infection. And what happens for reasons that we don't yet understand is typically when a kid is in his or her teens, they become permanently colonized by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and that's what kills people who have CF. And the reason is because of quorum sensing. So what happens is that Pseudomonas gets into the lungs, and then it turns on this quorum sensing cascade that allows it to adhere to the person's lung in what we call a biofilm, so a film, and then it covers itself with this goop that makes it impervious to antibiotics, and then the bacteria in unison start secreting all kinds of toxins and proteases and things that damage the person's lung tissue. And so the person eventually dies from the damage the Pseudomonas causes to the lungs. And so I don't want to pretend this is not terrible. It is terrible. But I want you to try to think about this from the bacterium's point of view. Right? The, the stupidest, sorry, it's an occupational hazard. Anyway, the stupidest thing a bacterium could do, for one bacterium to do, is to get in and to start secreting toxins. Right? First of all, if I start making toxins and I'm a little bacterium in a huge host, nothing's going to happen. Second of all, we have immune systems. So our immune systems evolve to see invading bacteria, to ferret them out, and get rid of them. So the better strategy from the bacterium's point of view is to get in, to wait, to count themselves with these small molecules, to recognize when they have the right number that if all of them launch this attack in synchrony, they're going to be able to overcome an enormous host. And so I used the Pseudomonas example um, up here on this slide, we have hundreds and hundreds of cases where virulence and pathogenicity is controlled by quorum sensing. I put this one up here, Erwinia keratovora. You've seen that one. That's the one that turns your lettuce brown in the refrigerator. So I want to make sure you have one. And so this one does the same thing. So it's trying to make a wound in a lettuce or a potato plant, right? So just like Pseudomonas, it waits until it has enough bacteria, and then they all launch this attack together and make the wound. But the really insidious thing that this bacterium does is simultaneously to launching this virulence um, attack, it also secretes all of these antibiotics that it has immunity to, but all the other bacteria in the soil don't. So what it does is it keeps the wound for itself and its siblings and kills off all the predator, or the competitors. But I think what you can see, you know, this list goes on and on and on, is the idea is that quorum sensing controls functions where I'm going to give something away, and I never have any hope of getting it back. I need my neighbor to participate in the collective activity, and then the activity becomes successful. So always virulence, biofilm, secretion of products are controlled by quorum sensing. So that's where we got to at the beginning. And so we started to think that we were understanding that these bacteria could communicate. They had this multicellular life. But then we started to think a little bit um, in a more sophisticated way about bacteria and how bacteria really live. And they really live like this. This is the back of your hand. This is just anybody's hand taken, a picture taken under the microscope. And I hope what you can see is that it is covered with all kinds of different bacteria. So each of these different shapes is a different species of bacteria. So you have thousands of species of bacteria on your skin, in you. And so what we started to think about, and it's like, wait a minute, we understood this quorum sensing business. But the truth is, is that bacteria live in unbelievably complicated societies. How could it be if these languages were for intra-species communication? How do they deal with this? And so then we wanted to start looking to think about a little bit more sophisticated chemical lexicon. And so the clue to that one also came from a crazy bacterium, which you're looking at a picture of. So what you're looking at here, this is a flask. This is a person from my lab. This is his hand, right? That's his nose holding this flask. And what I hope you can see is that the flask is glowing in the dark. So what's in this flask is a liquid culture of a bacterium that's related to Vibrio fischeri. This is Vibrio harvii. It's a bioluminescent marine bacterium but it doesn't live as a symbiont. It lives free living in the ocean. So it makes bioluminescence at high cell density just like Vibrio fischeri, but it lives a sophisticated life in that it has to deal with a not nice symbiotic environment. So we wanted to start studying that bacterium. And the reason I put this slide up here is to try, I thought maybe you would like to know like what do we actually do in the lab? And so, so we're geneticists in my lab. And so what was so fabulous about this bioluminescence, right, is that you can just see it, right? Most things that bacteria do are invisible, but bioluminescence isn't. And so what we do as geneticists, what we do is we make mutants, 
right, that are goofed up, in our case, for cell-cell communication. And then what was great about Vibrio Fisheri and Vibrio Harvey is you can just plate them out on Petri plates, turn the lights off in the room, just like this, look at the plates and look for bacteria that aren't making light when they should be or are making light when they shouldn't be. And just by doing that, we could find all of the genes that I've told you about and the ones I'm going to tell you about because the output, the readout of when the cells talk was something that we could see. And so that was sort of the way into the field. And now, of course, we've learned that this exists in all these other bacteria. So anyway, we started to study this cousin of Vibrio fisherized, Vibrio harvii, and doing what we do, our bag of tricks, which is to make mutants, we looked at what are the genes involved in quorum sensing in Vibrio harvii. And what we found was that indeed, just like Vibrio fisheri, there was an enzyme that made a molecule. I've actually shown you a picture of the Vibrio harvii molecule, one of these intraspecies communication molecules, and it has its partner receptor that binds it at high cell density. But in addition to that, we found there was a second system. There was another enzyme that made a different hormone molecule that also got secreted, and it had a partner receptor that bound it very specifically. And then all of that information comes into the cell to tell the cells to turn on or off light. So now we saw that there were these two systems running in parallel. And so even though we found them, the question is, what are they doing? Why is it better to have two systems than one? And so what we thought is the reason a bacterium would build it this way is if those molecules encode different pieces of information. And so to explore that idea, what we did was we made a mutant that was deaf to one of the signals. So we made a mutant that didn't have this system, right? We just knocked the genes out. So this bacterium makes light if you provide the system one hormone, the intraspecies communication, right? Does everybody get that? Yes, okay. Then we made the opposite mutant. We made a mutant that was missing this system. So it's, there's, these are like sort of partially deaf, right? <laughs> so it has this circuit. It turns on light if you give the second molecule. And then remember, these molecules are outside of the cells. So what we could do is we could just collect up every bacterium that we could find and take the liquids that they had been grown in and squirt those liquids onto this mutant and ask, do you make light? or squirt them on this mutant and ask, do you make light? And what we found is that there was never another bacterium that made an activity, a molecule like this, that turned on light through this system. And that makes sense because I've told you this is the Vibrio harvii species-specific language. But every bacterium we tested made an activity that turned on light through this second system. And so our interpretation of that result is that these are two different languages. This language, the specific language, as I've told you, is how the bacteria count their siblings. It's the intraspecies communication language. But this second molecule seemed to be generic. All the bacteria we could find made it. So we thought this is the trade language, the interspecies communication language that bacteria use. This is their bacterial Esperanto that allows them to talk across species. And so then consistent with that, we clone the gene and ask, what's the gene that makes this molecule, the gene that encodes the enzyme? And we found it. It was one gene that we named LUX-S. That's the enzyme that makes that second molecule. And you guys probably know that we have all these genome sequences, right? We have the human genome. Well, we have hundreds of bacterial genomes because they're little and they're easy to sequence. And so what you can do is take your favorite gene, in our case, LUX-S, and you can plug it into these databases and ask, does anybody else have that gene? And so sure enough, when we put LUX-S into the database, what we found out was that all kinds of species of bacteria had a highly conserved LUX-S gene All of them made this second activity. And I don't know who you want to know on here, but it is a who's who of notorious pathogens, right? Uh, Like that one's anthrax. I don't know. The class is over there. This is mono, right? uh, Staph, strep, enterococcus. This is... is STDs, whatever, <laughs> what do you want to know? whatever, whatever. So it's all of these pathogens, right? So it's a who's who of pathogens. So they all seem to make this molecule. And so then the question was, well, what are they doing with it? What are all of these bacteria doing with that molecule? I mean, they're obviously not turning on bioluminescence. They don't have bioluminescence. And so we started to look, what are the the genes, the traits that are controlled by this universal signal? And so we and lots of other labs started to study different bacteria. These are just some of the ones that we've studied. And what you can see is that in every case, what that molecule controls is biofilm formation and virulence. So just like the intraspecies communication molecule, it seems like this universal 
carboxyl molecule also has a huge role in controlling virulent processes in bacteria. So then we wanted to know, well, what is that molecule? So we purified it. This is it. These are just carbons. It's a five-carbon molecule. And what was important was that every single bacteria made exactly the same molecule. So unlike that, the intraspecies communication where each molecule is a little bit different, in this case, it is one molecule that all the bacteria are using to talk across species. So now what we're starting to think is that all bacteria are built like this. They have a way, some molecule that says me, and they count their siblings. And then they use this second molecule to say other. And what we know they're doing now is they're measuring ratios. So they do two things. The first thing bacteria do, they say, am I alone or am I in a community? So low cell density or high cell density. And then they carry out programs of gene expression that are good if you're alone or good if you're in a crowd. And then the more sophisticated question that they ask after they say, am I alone or am I in a group? They say, is it me or is it you? And they measure the ratio of these signals and then they do different things based on whether they're in the minority or they're in the majority just like we do. So in fact, right, they're making a very sophisticated computation. And what I should also say is that always, including in these bioluminescent bacteria, in all the bacteria, there are hundreds of genes in each bacterium that are controlled by quorum sensing. So when a bacterium goes from going it alone to acting as part of a community. It's an enormous program of development, just like in an embryo. So hundreds of genes have to turn on and off the right amount in the right order. And so they take in all of this chemical information to determine that program, just like in our bodies. Okay, so that's what, where we are in this right now too, right? So there's, there's two things happening. One is these bacteria have this multicellular character. The second thing is that Invariably, virulence and biofilm formation, two incredibly big problems in um, biotechnology or, you know, in healthcare today are controlled by quorum sensing. So the question is, now that we know that bacteria do this, can we actually manipulate this conversation, right, the way we want to? And so there's sort of two obvious strategies. So the first one is, if you wanted to target, you know, to manipulate the intraspecies communication system, so say you want a species-specific drug. You want a drug for pseudomonas, right? So then what you would do is try to make the bacteria so they can't hear or they can't talk with this language. And, that's, and we're working on that. The other possibility is you say, look, I want a broad-spectrum antibiotic that works against everybody. And so in that case, what you would do is target this second system. So either make them so they can't make the molecule or they can't detect the molecule. And so we have done both of those things. And what I thought, I, you know, the logic is exactly the same, no matter which of those systems you're working on. So I thought I would just tell you this one, even though, but we've done it for the other system as well. Okay, so the question is, we want to be able to shut down quorum sensing specifically. So the way you do that is through chemistry. So you guys know, let me go back one, that the, what I use for my cartoons for the molecule, right, I have these pink ovals, but you guys really know that that represents this molecule that I showed you, right? These molecules, you know, even though they're flat on the screen, they're, they're molecules with 3D, you know, um, shapes that fit into those receptors like locks and keys. And so what you want to do it's just like when you think about a key that doesn't fit into a door. You want to just change the shape of this molecule a little bit, right? So we'd like to put a sulfur here or a nitrogen or make a ring or do something like that, just so we change the shape a little bit. You do that through chemistry. And so by my cartoons, we go from this molecule to something that's a different shape. Right? And so we can do that with chemistry. The other way that we can do it is that there are libraries of molecules, the NIH and different um, government organizations, that sounds bad, different organizations that we have access to have hundreds of thousands or millions of molecules that chemists have made and they've been all put into a depository that we have access to. So the other thing to do is to just not try to change this one by one by one. That's slow. We've done that. But also just go and look at all molecules and say, even if I didn't know what the molecule's original shape was, can I just find one that fortuitously interferes with quorum sensing? So that's what we want to do. By whatever means we can, get a molecule that goofs up reception of that. So fine, we have access now. Either we made all these molecules, we made thousands of them, and we have access to a million of them. How do you actually find them? Most of those molecules do nothing, right? So what we decided to do is to go back to those Vibrio Harvii strains that I told you about. So remember, we have this Vibrio Harvii mutant that turns on light if you give it that second molecule, right? And so light is just something you can see. And so what we can do is one by one by one by one, test these hundreds of thousands of molecules for a molecule that makes it so that bacterium 
can't make light. So does everybody get that screen? Right, so you can screen with this bioluminescence assay through 100,000 molecules in a couple weeks. Okay, so we go from 100,000, a couple hundred thousand molecules, just one by one, a robot does this, okay, looking for bacteria that don't make light. And we found, so you go from a few hundred thousand to about a couple of thousand molecules in a week. The problem is, is if I put Clorox on this, it also won't make light, right? And so that's not what we want. We only want molecules that interfere with reception of the real one. So what we do is we go from these 100,000 molecules to 1,000 possibilities. And then remember, we made this other strain. So we have this other mutant that talks through this system. So we take the winners from the first screen. They shut down light in a bacterium that only senses the second signal, and then we put them on this mutant, and we look for ones that do nothing to it, that it still makes light, right? So then we know we're not killing it, we're not popping its membrane, we're not making it so it can't grow. We are simply shutting down that communication circuit. So does everybody get that? That's the hard, the only, yes, question. Uh, exactly, but specific, absolutely. In this case, it's just light, but specifically through this system. Yeah. Right, but we don't want something that just kills them, right, that makes it, or like something that just interferes with the enzymes that make light, right? We just want to stop communication. So we just go back and forth, no light, light. Everybody got that, right? And we get the molecules that specifically stop this system from working. So now you go from a few hundred thousand to about 20 in a week. The truth is, no one cares if I can turn off light in Vibrio Harvey. I've been doing that for 20 years, right? What they really care about is that, right? So we get these molecules, right? What we really want is an antibiotic, right? We want something that shuts down these harmful behaviors in a pathogen that matters, not in Vibrio Harvey. So we use the Vibrio Harvey screen to cull these molecules, right? We couldn't one by one test these in an animal. So we test them in this Vibrio Harvey screen. We went from a few hundred thousand to 20, and and that is a reasonable experiment to do in an animal. So you are supposed to put yourself here. Um, so what we do now is we take these 20 winners from those two screens, and we're using vancomycin-resistant enterococcus because that's a very bad pathogen. And we know that that bacterium kills this mouse, but it needs quorum sensing to do it. So if you infect the mouse with, with this pathogen, the mouse will die. And so the question is, if we infect the mouse with that pathogen, but we take those molecules that we got from those screens one by one, those 20 molecules, we, can we get a molecule that saves the mouse? And so, of course, the, of course, the answer is yes. Now we have two. So we went from r roughly about 300,000 molecules to two that look like they actually work to save that mouse. And that's where we are right now. These are not drugs. These molecules um, have to be, you would have to take a pill this big and it would kill you, right? You had, these molecules have to be refined. Medicinal chemists need to give these drug-like properties. These are simply the lead molecules that came out of the screen that look like they have potential to go forward with to try to develop into um, antibiotics. And so that is where we are right now. And then again, I also just want to say we also did it with the system one, you know, with these very species-specific molecules, the same exact strategy, just a different screen. Okay, so that's where we are, and what you're supposed to have learned tonight is that bacteria can talk to each other, and so I hope you think that they can talk to each other. Their language is chemical. They use chemical as their words, right? And then what we think that quorum sensing does is to make bacteria be multicellular, right? So what it allows them to do is to count one another and to, to turn on and off behaviors in enormous groups, and so what I would argue is that that Bacteria invented multicellularity. So bacteria have been on this earth for four billion years. Human beings have been on this earth for a couple hundred thousand. The rules for all of these things that happen that make us multicellular, we think the bacteria invented. And we think that when you think about the human body, in fact, the same kinds of principles get used to allow your cells to act in groups. It's just that we have a few more bells and whistles on our molecules, probably lots more molecules, but the ideas of how to have information flow were learned or were invented by these guys. And we hope that if we keep studying this, besides trying to do this practical thing, which is to make new therapeutics, we think we're also going to learn how multicellularity works in higher organisms. I hope what you also think after tonight's talk is that bacteria can distinguish self from other. They have a molecule that has, says me and a molecule that says 
other. And just by doing that with just those two molecules, that allows them to tell the self from other. And again, that's what happens in your body. It's not like your kidney cells get all mixed up with your heart cells every day. And that's because you have different sets of hormones that tell these groups of cells who they are and what they ought to be doing. And again, we think we can learn a lot by studying these much simpler systems of the bacteria to try to think about how organs work in the human body. And so then, of course, there's this practical thing, which is now that we understand that bacteria are having these conversations, can we manipulate it? And so, of course, I've given you this um, idea of stopping quorum sensing to make a new kind of antibiotic, but there's all kinds of other approaches as well. So, for example, like if we could hang these molecules, anti-quorum sensing molecules off of plastics, like if you knew you were going to get a catheter, you know you're going to get an infection, you know, if you could put this in toothpaste to keep bacteria, you know, from giving you cavities, you could put it in the saran wrap that wraps up your meat at the grocery store, right? There's all kinds of both industrial and med medical uses for these molecules. But then I also want to finish by giving a plug for the good bacteria. <laughs> so remember, there's also all these bacteria that do all these amazingly good things for us, like keep us alive. And we know they have quorum sensing. We know they have to act in groups to do good things as well. So beyond trying to stop quorum sensing by getting these antagonists, what we're also looking for are molecules that make quorum sensing better. So could we beef up the conversation of all these commensal bacteria that keep these invaders out. We also, in industry and in biotech, we use bacteria to, as little machines to make us all kinds of human products, right? If we could get them to do it better or more efficiently by making quorum sensing better, I think there's also a place to bring this stuff sort of out of the health food store and like really make the good bacteria do good things, you know, with sort of rigorous science underneath it. And then the final thing um, to make is just one confession which is that we didn't think that up. Um, now that we know that, you know, we, we can think, hey, maybe we can manipulate this conversation. We thought, well, maybe the bacteria have had this four billion year head start. Maybe they've already done that. And so we and lots of other people in my field have started to look out there in natural environments. And sure enough, that these bacteria are already trying to, you know, thwart the free ride, they eavesdrop, they eat each other's molecules, they make antagonists, you know, they're doing all of this chemical warfare. You know, there'll be one guy out there talking with one of those intraspecies molecules that has a ring with a chain on it, and the guy next to it makes an enzyme that cuts the chain off the ring, so the poor guy is talking, the other guy's making it mute. I mean, all of these shenanigans are going on out there, right, where they're manipulating each other's, both pro and con, manipulating each other's conversations. And so, of course, we think just like this, if we, like, try and learn what those naturally occurring pro and anti quorum sensing strategies are out there, they'll have already thought of the best thing, you know, the best possible strategy, and maybe we can just copy that for this biotech purposes. So how does temperature, extreme temperature Yeah, so uh, let me get, show my last slide, and then you're my first question, because I can't, I'm done. I just want to say, this is, these are my, this is my gang. So, um, you know, whenever, so this is my lab right now, um, and what you can see, what I hope you see, is that they are all, except for me, <laughs> between 20 and 30 years old. And so I just want to make the plug, and I know you guys come to all these science talks, so you already know that, but it, when you ever learn something that changes your mind about how the natural world works, or you read something in the New York Times or Scientific American, it was done by a child. <laughs> so it's always, <laughs> so the, this for you guys, the engine that drives science is always these 20 to 30 year olds, right? And so I just want you to know that the, the people that are my age are typists, right? These are the people that, that actually do all of the experiments and every discovery that I told you about was done by somebody's hands that's in that picture, right? So I just want to let you know that, that, that it's an amazing job I have because I keep getting older and older and they're always this age and they're really young and, yeah, and, and vivacious and they're tireless and they're not, they don't think the world works the way that we thought the world works and so they, so they found everything that I told you about. So I just wanted to make sure to say that before I take questions. But thanks for having me. Yeah.